everyone. Welcome back to the Light and Life podcast, conversations on faith and life in downtown Colorado Springs. I'm your host again here with Pastor Tim. Hey, Eliza. <laughs> what is it? It's Light and, Light and Life? Light and Life. Podcast? Podcast. Wow, that's pretty cool. It's been a minute. <laughs> it's been a minute. <laughs> uh, Pastor Tim and I were just talking about we haven't seen each other in like a month. So it's good to see you. It's fun. It's fun <laughs> to go do all this stuff, and then it's fun to see people again. And, yes. Uh, it's good to see you back, and <laughs> welcome home. I just gave him a bear hug in the hallway <laughs> <laughs> and tagged him <laughs> from the corner. <laughs> you didn't see it coming. No, I heard the heels coming. You did? From around the corner. <laughs> yep. But how'd you know it was me? Uh, you know. You had a feeling. Yeah, there's not a lot of heels down here in the creative <laughs> yeah. suite. <laughs> yeah, in my business professional outfit. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Another thing we were just talking about is, and, and listeners, you can research this however you want, is are diet drinks worse for you than regular <laughs> drinks? And I am sitting here with a big old McDonald's Diet Dr. Pepper. Yeah. No, this isn't sponsored, folks. Um, I just love Diet Dr. Pepper. Nice. And I got shamed for it walking in here. Really? Mm-hmm. Multiple times? Yeah. By you. That's what. <laughs> so it's interesting that you you're asking about it. I I mean it wasn't like a shame spiral. Mm-hmm. It was just talking about sugar, it's but just then... a tiny bit of you know. Are you really making good decisions, Liza? <laughs> you know, it could translate <laughs> into other areas of my life, but it is diet. Are you sure that's the best? Some decision? people say diet's worse. I don't know. We, we used to have friends, and um, they're still friends, but um, we were close a long time ago, and. And she had this way with her husband of saying, honey, I know you didn't mean to. And Abigail and I would laugh so, like, we would bite our tongues. Oh. To not, like, I know you didn't mean to put ranch on this. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. where is this going? Yeah. Oh, no. Like, are you making good decisions? Mm-hmm. I know you didn't mean to bring <laughs> McDonald's, Dr. Pepper. Here's the thing, though. I did. I oh, did okay. mean to. All right. Well, I consciously chose. Grab onto it. <laughs> Um, Own it. Well, so what are we talking about today, Pastor Tim? All right. We're launching into 2024 and um, thought we'd talk about the church series that we're in, the sermon series uh, about a church that makes disciples. We're doing this um, series called Church on Purpose. Mm. So when you think about, and of course, I think in, in um, when we pivot around the new year, of course, we're always thinking about what do we want to do? I'm not a big New Year's resolutions person, but... I think, um, you know, we're always sort of trying to think, okay, what do I want to change? What do I want to think about? Do I want to, what do I want to include in my life more? What do I want to exclude more? That sort of stuff. So um, Mm -hmm. uh, is your church life accidental or intentional? That's the big question of this, of this series. Is your Christian community, is your church life, is that just sort of, okay, whatever happens and works out is fine? Or is that one of those things that you put on your list of things that you're going to do intentionally? Like I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that this has a priority. Mm-hmm. And I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but what do you think about that that question? Um, <clears throat> I think there's so many different ways to kind of answer it because I would yeah. say yes and for to both. Um, I don't think. There's a ton of accidents in this life, really. Okay, so you don't believe in the accidental? Is that what I mean, you mean? I do. Or? I do to some extent. Like, I yeah. mean, you can stumble into a situation or a community, but I mean, there is the bigger picture. And as a Christian, like I, I know that there's an author of my story and right. my plan. But um, the intentional side, you know. I would say, in my experience, um, my church life has happened because of my experiences. I haven't always been intentional in yeah in, in my pursuit. A lot of times, I feel like people have been intentional in their pursuit of me and like my heart for Christ, and that's then helped me to start learning to be intentional, but I haven't always been there and my church life was still there. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, 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 I think that word intentional, um, sometimes it has, it's pretty heavy and it's, Mm -hmm. it's, um, uh, like particularly with parenting, there's always a lot of like, is this, is everything intentional? Is everything intentional? And it feels like 
uh, everything everything shouldn't be intentional. And even if you talk about your faith as a relationship with Jesus, you know, in some ways you don't want a relationship to be intentional. You want it to be natural, mm-hmm. organic. But but in other ways, you know that if you don't have um, attention, you know, to to give it, if you're not putting it on your calendar, if you're not uh, taking time for it, that it will suffer because it sure. doesn't get that kind of. So there has to be some intentionality. Um, so what what do you think? I mean, what do you think about? Is it good to be intentional about um, your spiritual walk? Absolutely, I think yeah. it it's great to be intentional with your spiritual walk. And um, but going back to that question, I have. I'm having a hard time, you know, giving a definitive answer because I don't necessarily think it's accidental um, that I'm here and that I have a relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Um, but intentional, I think that that's relative to the person maybe. So you kind of um, want to be open to what God is doing. Sure, but I think it's or, absolutely important to be intentional. I mean, we've talked yeah. about <clears throat> certain spiritual disciplines that you can um, incorporate into your life, such as, you know, a quiet time or setting aside a, a place to read in the morning or dive into Scripture or yeah. gratitude. Um, right. Taking time to write down your daily delights. <laughs> yeah, some, that's right. Different things we talked about, journaling, mm-hmm. reading, um, tent, going to church, um, making sure you're in a group of, uh, like a life group or a Bible study, that sort of stuff. So I think there's, there's some level of intentionality. And I think one definition of intentional is, um, so, well, one way to look at it is pre-deciding the more valuable things. So if you're totally accidental about it, you're just letting it happen to you, then a lot of times you'll look back and say, oh, I didn't pick, I didn't actually pick what I value more. I picked a lesser thing because that's what I felt like doing in the moment. So one way to look at intentionality is to say, I'm going to do um, the good thing and I'm going to decide now to do the good thing, the better thing in the future, even if it means a sacrifice. And so then when you walk up to it, it's like, I don't feel like getting out of bed or, you know, going to church or going to, I don't feel like getting dressed and going to life group or, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But you've dis- you've pre-decided. No, I've, I've, in- I've pre-decided that this is important, so I'm going to make the sacrifice for it. I'm going to sacrifice my present comfort for my future well-being, mm-hmm. kind of which is true for sure. anything, right? It's like it's true for exercise or for... Um, learning how to play an instrument or any of those things. We're just working, really. Like work. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. I'm gonna I, do this now. I so get a paycheck later, maybe. Get a paycheck later, or, <laughs> or get to this other place later where more things are possible, and mm-hmm. I can um, have a positive impact on more people. Yeah. So, so a church is like a person in that way. Um, a church, a lot of churches, it can start to feel accidental, just like whatever happens, happens. Um, but I think that is not so good. <laughs> yeah, that's tricky. <laughs> I think I think for a church to get into an accidental rhythm is just sort of like we do the same thing all the time because it's the same thing that we do all the time, and then you're just in a rut. You're just doing what's regular, what's normal, what's habitual, and that is the death knell for a church community. It's just like we just always do the same thing because we always do the same thing, and we've got no attachment to Christ's mission, and this is how churches, frankly, this is how churches become museums. Mm. So uh, this, uh, this, se- this series is about, hey, reminding the church we do have a purpose. And that purpose is something that Jesus articulated. We call it the Great Commission. Matthew 28, I'm just going to read this for us. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So that's the last thing Jesus said to his followers. Mm -hmm. He said, between the time that I leave and the time that I come back, this is what you need to be doing. 
So as someone asked me once, um, basically based on that, there's really only one question to ask about church on purpose. If you're a church, do you have a method for making disciples, and is it working? So uh, that's something we're kind of, yeah. So what do you think about making disciples? I mean, when you hear that, what's a disciple? What do you, what do you think in that? that means to you? I think a disciple is a follower of Jesus. And I think there's a, a huge difference between just a believer and a follower. Hmm. I think to, to bear Christ's name and call ourselves Christians, it's important to be a follower and to want that for other people, want other people to experience his love and his joy hmm. because of the love and the joy that we found. Why would we not want to share that? I think making disciples is is spreading that and spreading the truth. Um, but I am curious, like as as a church and kind of what you were saying, how do we get out of the monotony of just like wash, rinse, repeat yeah. our, our message and how do we tailor it to um, to every kind of person that walks through yeah. the doors? Yeah. Or, and, or at least in a way that is going to be relevant to the place, right. to where we are. Right, and <laughs> adapting to, to certain things. And how does that play an even bigger role in church capital C versus, you know, here at First Pres at, yeah. um, in Colorado Spring? So there's a huge value in church to regularity, to... Um, Kind of, I come back to church to touch base with what I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, there's a huge value to being part of a community that isn't just the product of one particular generation and context, but a community, the body of Christ, that's that's part of uh, that spans history. You know, spans all time and history, and I want to touch base with that. So, for those reasons, you're slow to change things, but. What institution is there that is still trying to to perform its mission or execute its mission today in the same way that it was doing even in like 1985, you know? Right. <laughs> but a lot of times churches are doing like, this was, this. if you were here in 1985, you would have seen this is really, this really works, you know? And, um, so, and people wouldn't believe you probably. Yeah, for, right. <laughs> for certain things. I know that um, even... Millennials or Gen Zers wearing jeans to church is like a crazy idea. Oh yeah, <laughs> to people. So yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. Even those uh, kinds of things are. You know whether you can wear a ball cap in church. Ooh, that's a toughie. Whether you can have <laughs> a coffee cup in church, uh -huh. <laughs> and um, and some of that stuff. But there's so much more, right? So, mm -hmm. well, so what we're going to talk about in the series is is kind of how we want to help people to take steps forward. And, of course, who makes disciples? I mean, I don't make disciples. You know, I don't convert people. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. But we want to be cooperative with the Holy Spirit. And, who, and I, think, I think the life with the Holy Spirit is, is a lot about uh, expectation and anticipation and hope. Like, I hope to see this. Um, boy, I was talking with uh, somebody last night um, who, uh, um, I'm going to not share who it is, but um, I was just had an awesome conversation with him, and uh, he has uh, just opened his eyes to faith, opened his eyes to Jesus just in the past couple of months. And his, his wife came to Christmas Eve service with him, and after that, she wanted to buy a Bible, and he said, I was so excited because he only bought a Bible a couple months ago before that. Mm -hmm. And so, and then he said, and I'm praying, and I've seen God answer prayers already. That's and, so cool. And just the magic of like, boom, I'm, suddenly I'm in a world where God is active. And the joy on his face of like, uh, like I can actually see God doing things. Like this isn't just me thinking this is real. I can no I can notice that God is at work in the world. And I just celebrated with them. I was just so excited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's the 
like we just want to have expectation so that we can see. Like if you're not watching for something, you're not going to see it. If you're not open to something, you're not going to see it. But we want to create the platforms, the sort of places, the times and spaces where the Holy Spirit can do these things. Well, so the way that we're teaching the church in this, and, and uh, listeners just want to go a little deeper with you on some of these things, is is to kind of see that people need to move from one position to another. A lot of times we measure things in church, we measure the success vertically, like how many people came. Mm -hmm. Oh, we had, you know, 4,500 people at Christmas Eve. That's great. We have this huge number, this number we can talk about. But nobody's going to care about that even three years from now, let alone like 100 years from now. The big question is, of those people that were at that event, did anybody take a step forward toward Jesus? right? Because that's what's going to change the world. So instead of measuring vertically, we want to measure how people are moving along. That's and, cool. And to do that, we kind of try to think about where people are. So we've got five categories on what our church calls the discipleship pathway. The first category is community members. And what's that? That's just, that's just our way of talking about the 750,000 people that live around within a half an hour, 45 minutes of our church. So a lot of them are just strangers. And the big challenge with that is just, are we as a church taking time to understand who they are, um, what questions they have about their life, what uh, cultural narratives, uh, what story, what big stories they use to explain their, their life, the kinds of things that they're facing and the challenges that they have. If we're sent by God to reach this city for Christ, if you were a missionary, you know, if you were off to Tajikistan to be a missionary, what would you do? You'd learn about those people. So are we taking time to learn about the people around us? Mm -hmm. yeah. And invest in them. And invest in too. them. Yeah, we, I think a big thing is um, we say light and life for the city because one of the biggest questions about a church's reputation is, do the people around you who don't know Jesus, do they at least believe that you are for them, that you're, you're a proponent of their well-being? You know? And so we work hard as a church in the community member area. To be like We want everybody to know First Pres is here to be for you. You might not agree with everything that we think or believe, but we want you to know that we are here for you. We're and that's, for you. I mean, ultimately... The definition of love, right, is willing the good of another mm. equal to or more than yourself. Than yourself at your own sacrifice. And I think, yeah, mm. being involved in the community um, however you can to just love on people in that way and live something that I like to see, I think, mm. and I, I see consistently among a lot of our members is people living their lives as an invitation. Okay. Yeah, you know, open right. door policy at their homes or, um, you Hospitality know, just, is yeah, so huge and fellows experience it when people open their homes to total strangers who are moving in here for that program. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, you don't want to overdo like what's our reputation in the community, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to me that, that our church is known to be a helpful uh, advocate, you know, that, that people would genuinely say, well, I don't agree with everything that First Pres believes, but I know that church is for the good of, of, of our community and of me. Yeah. Right. Okay. So We're what's next? Enough on that? Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So then we say, okay, well, those are strangers. Um, you can't do much with strangers. Uh, so the next category is what we call participants. So, our church, we interact with people in a whole lot of different ways. We've got some people who just drop their kids off at VBS, you know, and that's that's our only interaction with them. Vacation Bible school in the summer. Um, we've got people who use our facilities for, um, uh, you know, addiction recovery meetings or grief meetings, or we've got people who just, you know, they just sort of glance up against us. Um, and we know their name, and we've got their email. We've got their address. So we start sending them spam. <laughs> <laughs> you professionally stalk them. Yeah, we stalk them professionally. 
we chase them and make them feel no we um, <laughs> yeah we show up on their door and like peer in the window um no but we we care about them and we know that they that god has put them in our path and so we want to care for this group and we want to invite them well like we want to say okay we know your name you know our name um we want a relationship that grows we want a relationship that that builds and we want to be near them and here's probably the big thing um and this is a big thing to say, and uh, we'll see how listeners feel about this or if we get some reaction to this, but here's my contention. If you're building your life around a story, a cultural narrative, a worldview that isn't founded on Jesus Christ, at some point, it's going to come up short for you. At some point, it's not going to... Um, to to be sufficient. And when that happens, uh, that's what leaders in the past, the old theologians in the past, have called the crisis moment. When you suddenly realize that I thought I had things figured out and I was building my life around this key principle and or this uh, key goal, and I came to this moment where that all collapsed. And when that collapse happens, um, the goal is, as Christians in this community, that we are near enough, that we're beside uh, our friends, our neighbors, our family members who don't know the Lord, when that happens, that we're close enough that we can share Jesus with them in that moment. And they know that we're for them, we love them, we want to sit with them through the difficult moments. But when the cultural narrative collapses, when their worldview is not sufficient, we want to be present. We want to be right next to them, ready to, to share who, who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That makes Very sense. Well said. So when someone comes to know the Lord and when they, um, they see that Jesus is the Son of God and they, uh, you know, they have a, a lot of questions, no doubt, but when they come to a place of saying, I call Jesus Savior and Lord, well, then they become what we call worshipers. So the next category from participants is worshipers. And this is the life change. Like, I used to value this, and I used to think that God was interesting, but sort of of lower value than my career or my relationships. Or, uh, Well, now I've come to a place where I realize that God is the only thing that's actually worthy of my praise. Like I can shout at a football game. I can, I can scream at a concert. Um, but those things are just momentary, fleeting, sort of emotional moments. But when I worship God, I know that, that something's going on that is right deep down to my core. And so these are people who have become worshipers. Is there some sort of sliding scale between participants and worshipers? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, going from... You might just see someone dropping off a kid at VBS to, you know, singing praises. Is there an yeah. in-between that, and I'm sure there is, but where you recognize that he might be worthy of worship and worthy of praise, but they, they aren't sure of how to express that? Mm. Like they might partake in going to a worship service or... Right. Um, might be interested in leaning into conversations about faith and you know why it's important and recognizing um, God's wonder and His power. Yeah. Without being an active worshiper. So I think I believe that there's a conversion moment. I believe that there are there are um, there's a time when you become a worshiper when you come to know Jesus that okay. you, you, you sort of realize, I'm not the same person that I was. Like, the lights have come on. Mm -hmm. There's something now that I see, that I know, that I experience, that I honestly can't, I can't deny that knowledge, and I can't go back from that knowledge. Jesus talked about it as being born again, born again from above. And now you're a new person, and there's this old person back there, and a lot of those old person habits are still in you, so you haven't yet formulated the habits that match what you really now know. Gotcha. But the lights have come on. Okay. Does that make sense? Totally. But also I would say, you know, 
the lights come on in different ways. Some people, it's like lightning strike, and you know the lights just come on full bore in a moment. Uh, but many, many people, it's like a sunrise. It's like there's a little more light, there's a little more light, there's a little more light. And then by the time it's day, you can't actually like always put a pin on like when the moment was, uh-huh. but the light has come on. And, and now you can clearly say, oh, I mean, the lights are on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? What right. I mean? But um, that's how I talk about that. Yes. And, but Sorry that, about that segue. But that category is also, you know, we've got a lot of people who um, an hour of worship is all they do. Like, I think, um, I think my church thing is one hour a week, uh, if that, maybe like uh, a few times a month or a couple times a month, and it might get down to like 10 times a year. Um, and I just, I know the lights are on. I know what's true. I know God is worthy of praise. But my habits are such that I, I don't really make it into church all that much. Or or if I do, that's the only thing I do is I make it to, to, to worship. Mm-hmm. But Jesus didn't actually say, go out and make worshipers. He said, go make disciples. Yeah, disciples. So, so like you said, a disciple, that's the next category, is um, somebody who wants to change, who wants to grow. You know, the difference between a student and a disciple is a student wants to learn what the teacher has to say. A disciple wants to be who the teacher is. Like, I want to be that person. Like, wow. I, I was just, you know, um, not Novak Djokovic. That's the uh, tennis player. Who's the guy who plays for um, basketball for uh, the for Denver? Oh, um, <laughs> sports. You need okay. to know this because you're in sales. Is it not just pop quiz? Jokic or Jokic? Is that right? Probably not. Yeah, we could be. But, the guys but, but, were, were embarrassing. Yeah, ourselves. I know. Sorry. <laughs> this is tough. <laughs> yeah. If, if you thought this was a sports podcast, uh-huh. you have just learned. <laughs> but yeah. somebody was saying last night, looking at him, and he won another MVP award or something like that. And and um, and the sportscaster was saying, look, I'm telling you, if I was a basketball player right now, I would look at that guy, and I would do what he does. I would eat what he eats. I would sleep as long as he sleeps. I would practice exactly what he practices. I would do everything he does. I would want to be that guy. Right. That's how it is when you're a disciple of Jesus. Like, I don't, I don't want to just want to learn this so I can use it. I don't just want the information. I want the wisdom so that I can actually be more like Jesus. So those are disciples. And they go to classes, they go to Bible studies, they like information, they like to learn. But there's one last step that we lift up at this church, and that's to ask, so you've learned a lot about um, faith, but are you trying it on? Have you found your spiritual gifts, and are you using them for the kingdom? And so we call that an active disciple, because a lot of times people just learn and learn and learn, and they don't really do. And the scripture says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. And a lot of times you get in a discipleship cycle where it's almost like it's like eating calories and not expending them. So you just, you know, you take calories in. Blah, blah, blah. Unless it's a Diet Dr. Pepper from... Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and, and is it a Diet Dr. It's zero Pepper? calorie. Okay. It is. All right. It is. All right. But yeah, <laughs> that's fine. But no, you, you just, just take calories in and you don't expend any calories and that's not, that's not healthy. So we want to encourage people to, to activate their discipleship, to find their gifting, to to serve the Lord somewhere, find a place to serve, find a place to use your, your gifts. So Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, his, big, his biggest talk, I mean glo- global, like world-changing sermon. You know, we just had Martin Luther King Jr. Day, um, greatest speech, you know, one of the greatest speeches, I have a dream speech. Uh, that speech, he was a man who was inspired by the speech that Jesus gave called the Sermon on the Mount. So it's just like this sermon is probably the the sermon of all sermons in history. Right. So at the end of that, Jesus said, Matthew 7, 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person, a wise man, a wise woman who built their house on the rock. So, um, so it's not just about learning. It's not just about information. It's about what are we going to do? How are we going to live this out? That's wisdom. That's becoming like like Jesus. Well, that about sums up our time. Thank you so much for um, digging into that. 
And if you're enjoying these conversations on Faith and Life, as always, please leave us a review so that more people can find us. And we'd love for you to join with us in the conversation. So if there's a topic or a question um, that you want us to discuss, please just send an email to podcast at firstprezcos.org. Or if you're watching the video version on YouTube, leave a comment below. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode when Tim will sit down with Chris, Chris Cullens, to talk about writing praise songs, making music for God. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks. All right. See you, everybody. I was, I was going to, yeah, nice. that was tough to be left hanging there.